everyone, my name is Jason Holmberg. I'm the executive director of a very unusual nonprofit organization called Wild Me. Now in, in today's talk called Software and Machine Learning Engineers Join the Fight Against Extinction, we're gonna cover some pretty fun ground. We're gonna talk about artificial intelligence, but in a very meaningful and applied way. We're gonna talk about very large sharks. Along the way, we're gonna reference leafy and weedy sea dragons in Australia and we're even going to get some intellectual inheritance from the Hubble Space Telescope. So sharks, artificial intelligence, space telescopes, lots of fun ground, but really uh, I'm not going to do a very good job as a speaker if I don't get one core point apart. The story you're about to hear is very much my story as a technical writer and later as a software developer uh, who joined the fight against extinction, who, who found that I have skills that I can contribute in not just as a volunteer in a small way, but in a very large and meaningful way, skills that are needed to prevent the sixth mass extinction, to join these teams of biologists and academics in making a meaningful difference in understanding the natural world. Uh, and in, in doing original research, along the way it has changed my life. And along the journey of this presentation, I'm really hoping that you see a way that your software development skills actually can make a difference. Let's get started. So this is a little bit about me. And, and generally, when you attend a, an artificial intelligence talk, you're going to get uh, a, a lecture or a talk from somebody who is the, the foremost expert in uh, artificial intelligence in a particular domain. Or if you're attending a talk about big sharks, you're going to get you know, the premier biologist uh, studying white sharks, for example. I'm none of these things. So uh, my background is in chemical engineering. Uh, from the University of Michigan and in Arab studies from Georgetown, which makes me a very unusual presenter to be talking about machine learning uh, and wildlife. However, I began my career in the corporate world working for Dell Technologies. I started out as a technical writer, moved on to information architect, and along the way picked up both technical writing and communication skills, which are critical for the advancement of my career, as well as some actual coding, because I couldn't just be stuck letting others manage the data. I had to actually develop the skills myself and eventually went on to do data management and finished my career at Dell in a machine translation group working on um, implementing the newest versions of deep learning for machine translation. And then along, along my journey, uh, I ended up founding an NGO, a nonprofit called Wild Me. And in 2018, I was able to leave the corporate world and enter the NGO world as executive director of Wild Me. So I very much come from a background of professional skills uh, developed in the corporate world. Let's talk about big sharks. So I have been a scuba diver since I was age 12, but not a frequent scuba diver. There weren't a lot of opportunities in some of the places I lived to go scuba diving. But I did have an opportunity uh, living in Egypt to fly down to Djibouti and to see my first whale shark when I was scuba diving. Now, Seems like we're off on a tangent in a coding conference, but bear with me here for a second, because we need to establish the mystery of the whale shark. The whale shark is the world's biggest fish. Unlike some of the big toothy sharks, this is a shark you want to swim toward. They have uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of very small, tiny teeth. They're very safe to swim with, and they're an impressive size. A whale shark, a male whale shark, gets up to about 10 meters. A female whale shark can get up to 20 meters. So these are very large, very long-lived animals. They may live more than 100 years. Scientists simply don't know, but likely an animal like this lives longer than I do. Some fun facts. Whale shark birth has never been witnessed. Whale shark mating has never been witnessed. Of all the whale sharks on the planet, we have tagged one on a migration route, meaning that these are animals that swim thousands of miles. We don't know where they swim to. We don't know where they spend most of their time. Even more interesting fact, a whale shark female can give birth to up to 300 pups, of which our giant global database will get one report of one pup once a year. That is how rare, weird, and mysterious the animal is. However, it is also beautiful, and you will never forget if you see a whale shark. As I saw my first whale shark, a question popped into my head as I thought about the experience, which is, okay, an animal is thought of as endangered, you know, and, and the whale shark is currently listed by the IUCN as endangered, but what does that mean? 
when I swam with my first whale shark and, and really hadn't begun my journey into the world of conservation, I didn't really understand that word. So I started looking it up and, and clearly most people are going to understand. Okay. So how do we know that a whale shark is endangered? Um, well, obviously in, in most circumstances, we're going to think, well, if it's endangered, it means that there are less of them than there used to be. And in the future, there may be even fewer all the way down to what the IUCN would consider extinct, meaning they are gone entirely. So then the question that popped into my mind is, well, how do you, how do you count them? So this is a very rare animal. It's sighted far from land. You know, what is the process that wildlife biologists go through in counting animals? Well, it can be quite challenging. So we can count different animals and we can see that those counts are more or less year upon year. And by that, we can get a sense of, uh, is this population endangered? Is it threatened? Are things going well or going poorly? But if the solution is count them, the problem can also be count them. So my nonprofit also works on zebras, not just sharks. And here's, this is actually an easy case. There are somewhere between 12 and 14 zebras, and it can be hard to count. And you might even think if you look close enough that there are two headed zebras in this photograph. Now this is one photograph. Imagine taking 10 photographs in a row with the zebras milling about and trying to get a count from all those different animals, an exact count. And now try to imagine doing that a thousand or 10,000 times year after year. And you can see that the challenge is counting them can be quite difficult. It gets even worse because zebras in the last photograph were standing right next to the road that made it easy for humans. Migratory animals, elephants, whales, sharks, for example, move about, and they will often move to places that are not especially hospitable for humans. They move to cold places, very hot places, underwater, and even when they're nearby, they're milling about, making it difficult to do accurate counts. So one of the ways that biologists will begin counting animals that are a little bit more remote is to fly planes over them and to do what are called aerial transects, where you go back and forth across a landscape and count the animals. And quite literally, the state of the art, the accepted state of the art for aerial transects is to have humans in the back of the plane with clipboards, counting them and writing down on the clipboard. Obviously, this is a space ripe for modernization. It gets even worse though. The picture I showed before about elephants was an easy case itself. You could see the elephants and even approximately count them. It would be difficult to say without these yellow bounding boxes on the left, whether you could even see elephants in this picture or not. And these yellow bounding boxes were drawn by aerial survey experts, people who look for elephants all the time in photographs. This is an example of the real world challenge of trying to count animals in the wild. So biologists came up with a solution, which was in order to track animals over time and not double count the same animal, we can tag them. So for deer, it was an ear tag clipped to the ear with a number that individually identified the deer. And if we saw 36 once, we would count it. And if we saw it a second time in the same day, we wouldn't count it. And ideally we would go out into the field year after year some years we would see 36 and some we wouldn't, and we'd be able to create, create statistical models that would project the population size. Now for other species, how we tag an animal is different. For a sea turtle, for example, it can be a, a uh, clip on the fin. For a bird, it can be a band uh, on the foot. And the ability to identify and re-identify the same individuals is very powerful. And it's not just in population estimation, but in molecular ecology, in animal biometrics, in toxicology, being able to see the toxin load of a particular individual at different study sites can help us identify where pollution is, for example. So there's all these benefits to physically tagging an animal, but it's not that easy, of course. So one of the problems is physically tagging an animal is that these tags fall off or foul up. Now I've already played a dirty trick in that I've already shown you in this presentation, a tag on the previous whale shark slide. And here I have it circled in red. This is a tag that I saw on a whale shark in um, Honduras. And 
somebody went through the effort to tag this animal, take a spear and stick a, a small metal piece under its skin that trails this tag. And already it's so fouled up that even me reciting it can't report back to the biologist that I know which animal I saw and helped in their research. And you can see at the top here in the slide that um, this S250, um, this would be a, a Seychelles tag for a whale shark. You can see an example of that tag about six months later. It's unreadable. So this is an example of why physically tagging an animal can be quite challenging. It gets even worse though. Not only do the tags fall off and foul up, but actually tagging an animal can interfere with its natural movement. It can irritate the animal. And even in the worst case examples, because often these tags will break the skin, they can uh, lead to infection and even death. So physically tagging an animal, while it, it's a very low volume way of tracking individuals, but it's also high risk and low yield. So uh, this is actually some of my team working with some zebra researchers in Kenya. The idea came about um, about a decade and a half ago. Well, what, what if we could identify them in pictures? What if we could identify individual animals um, either with, uh, you know, advanced mirrorless cameras or the cell phone cameras that are now ubiquitous. And rather than physically tagging them, we could distinguish them between photographs, not get in their way, not physically injure them, and track and estimate population sizes that way. Obviously, this is a great idea. Um, there's a real challenge, though. How do you track individuals across hundreds, thousands, ten thousands? And my team currently is tracking animals across six million photographs. Well, the basic concept is if we take pictures of animals in the wild, we need to identify them in those pictures. This is an easy case. And even this has its challenges. This is the dorsal fin of a bottlenose dolphin off of California as it breaks the water. On the left, you can see a nice perpendicular photograph of this bottlenose dolphin. And there's a couple of ways that we might be able to identify this individual. There is a faint set of scarring near the top of the fin, which sort of makes a V shape. There's also the trailing edge, which is very notchy. And that notch can be thought of much like a human fingerprint. It's going to be unique per individual. On the right, you can see the same animal. We can still see the V, although the scarring is much more prominent. We can still see the notches, but the animal isn't perpendicular anymore. So a human might be able to very quickly, if they're an expert and have made comparisons before, they might be able to very quickly make this identification. That's if you have a small catalog. If you have, for example, thousands of photographs or tens of thousands of photographs collected across a 40 year project of bottlenose dolphins, the average generally is per photograph of a fin it might take you nine hours to flip through a catalog of 40 years of dolphins and figure out which dolphin is this. Okay, so right now we've got an engineering challenge. This is awesome. And it gets even more complex. So it's not just looking for one dolphin across photographs. There are often multiple zebras in a photograph. And for each of those zebras in each of these photographs, we've got a query across a catalog. This is where we start seeing how computer programmers fit into this new world. The world of wildlife biology is really split into two parts. One is academia, where original techniques in computer vision, promising ideas and statistical models are developed. And then there's field biology. Conservationists in the field, in Kenya, in Madagascar, in Mexico, wherever they are, they are local experts. They know their animals. They know their local populations. They know the, man, the government authorities they need to talk to about protections. And they understand the local climate and environment and different means whereby they can develop locally appropriate conservation strategies that actually protect the animals. But between these two groups is this giant area of engineering. How do we get these promising techniques in machine learning and statistics in data management out of academia and into the hands of field biologists who don't have the technical skills. And that's where databases, machine learning, computer vision all come in. And you actually need a technical team to support and sort of bring these two communities together long term. So what are we going to do? We're going to engineer. 
And that was my journey as I was working at Dell, really beginning to experience and understand whale shark research. I saw that there was a need for me. Somebody needed to bring computer vision to the whale shark world and support it long term and make sure that it's implemented with good user uh, design and with in a way that field biologists all across the globe could easily access it without installing a large application. I started with the computer vision piece. And an interesting aspect here is that when I started, there was no computer vision for whale sharks. There was just this hypothesis that whale sharks were individually identifiable based on their spot patterns. So that's great. We think the spot patterns are like a human fingerprint and each individual animal can be identified that way across photographs. If we could do that, it means that anyone who takes a photograph, whether it's a biologist, a tourist, uh, or even uh, you know a tour company bringing tourists out could collect photographs and we could tag and track these animals simply from photography. And this is why it's important to have engineers in the loop because the spot pattern recognition algorithm had never been tried on whale sharks. And in fact, it wasn't in the domain of biology. Where it was sitting was in the domain of astronomy. So originally back in 1984, an astronomer had been tasked uh, under NASA funding with the need to take multiple photographs from the Hubble Space Telescope and be able to stitch them together to create a large mosaic of the night sky. And the way they approached that was to overlap different star constellations, different star patterns, so that they aligned and had the same zoom and were able to essentially overlap each other and create this bigger picture of the night sky. This algorithm was, was called the Groth algorithm. Um, and we were able to stumble across this um, in, in a, a very random way, unfortunately, in our, our research, but we did, and say, wait a second, um, spots on the night sky are really similar to spots on a whale shark. What if we were to use the star pattern matching algorithm and cross apply it to the domain of whale sharks? And we did. And this was our very first foray into how do we as engineers uh, support conservation research? And we developed this uh, spot pattern matching algorithm that could identify the same indi individual whale shark from different photographs from different years. Here's the problem. There was nowhere to run it. Um, it was a very sophisticated Java-based algorithm. Um, we could run it in the cloud, but there wasn't a data management framework. All the different wildlife biologists across the globe had different databases. They stored their photographs differently. Their data was in different levels of curation. Some of it was very clean. Some of it was very messy from years of historical changeover and different staff members. So developing this computer vision algorithm was only 10% of the work. 90% of it was actually creating a data management framework for wildlife biology. And even there, there wasn't a data schema that was obvious that we could just say, oh, this has been used for marker capture. This has been used to track animal populations. We'll use that. So along the way, we had to develop and adapt other schemas to really fit this new world of tagging and tracking individual animals. And we created this Java-based application called Wild Book. At first, we only applied it to whale sharks, and it became whaleshark.org, the wild book for whale sharks. We've recently rebranded it to sharkbook.ai because now we're studying multiple species of sharks. We can not only match whale sharks, but we can match white sharks based on their fins. Uh, we can match tiger sharks and others. But we really had to develop some place for wildlife biologists to log in and put their data in a common database and schema so that we could then compare photographs across regions and migration routes and data sets. And this is really what the Wild Book ecosystem currently looks like. Wildlife can be observed by members of the public. It can be captured off of social media. Citizen scientists are very dedicated volunteers and individuals. I actually fall into this category myself. And then we have uh, your traditional field biologists studying wildlife. All of their data can be collectively pooled into a data management server, where then data scientists can access it and run new statistical techniques. That data, data management server is J2EE based. And then we separately have an image analysis server, a Python based machine learning server. And so this is, this is the ecosystem that different uh, 
uh, different researchers, whether they're in the computer vision world, data science or biology, can access data, share data in a common format, and then run computer vision to help find animals and track them. Now, it wasn't just whale sharks. Immediately, we quickly moved to manta rays and other species, and we developed a set of wild books. Some are small, some are big. One of my favorite wild books right now is for leafy and weedy sea dragons. This is called Sea Dragon Search, and it's used by only a handful of researchers, but hundreds of snorkelers and divers in Australia to track individual leafy and weedy sea dragons. So the weedy sea dragon is in the upper right. The leafy sea dragon is in the bottom left. Um, and we're able to apply machine learning to automatically find the body of the animal, then from that find its head and run that head to an identification algorithm where the different spots across the head can be matched to an individual. And now we're able to, to provide machine learning and good data management to study the species. But that's a small wild book. And we can scale up our wild books, uh, which, are, which is an open source project, by the way, to support hundreds of researchers, for example. Um, flukebook.org is where we study multiple species of whales and dolphins. And we have computer vision for over 20 of those species and fully automated identification, which means as a researcher submits a photograph, it will be automatically sent to machine learning for detection, find this animal, and then individual identification, um, which animal is this? And we can do this with multiple animals per image. An important aspect of this as well is this concept that as an open source package, Wildbook provides pluggable APIs. That means that as academia develops new computer vision and machine learning techniques for individual identification, or detection and imagery, we have a place for those to be put and tested where data is accessible for testing of them. And now we can speed how fast new techniques in computer vision and machine learning get over to biologists. So let's talk about from, from moving from, from one application, whale sharks, to a few species to the bigger picture. So, as my journey as a software developer and conservation grew, and I found more and more of my time being spent building this open source project called Wildbook, and it began to challenge my ability to, let's say, work a day job in the corporate world, I found that I needed to hire programmers. I needed to grow my team because demand was increasing. And this is how WildMe came about very organically, from my journey to become an actual organization. And currently, WildMe has seven software professionals and two machine learning engineers working out of Oregon. We are full time. The, our only job is to develop open source packages to deploy and support them in support of uh, conservation research for marine and terrestrial species across the globe, from African wild dogs to jaguars to right whales. We like to say conservationists do the work and WildMe does the engineering. Now, Wild Me doesn't claim to save any wildlife at all. We don't. We are the technologists backing the field biologists, the locally embedded experts who know what conservation strategy would work in their environment. Our job is to support them with good data management and advanced machine learning tools so that they can create data-driven strategies that are locally effective. And really, our job as engineers sandwiched in between academia and field biology is to iterate. This is not really a concept that was in the, the biology world um, that really engineers can bring to this. So when we think about this concept sort of circling back to the word endangered, when we think about endangered, we're, we're saying there are fewer animals than there used to be. And that's great. Okay, if we identify that there's a problem, we can develop a conservation strategy, hopefully if we have enough data that works. But then when we develop this conservation strategy, we have to evaluate whether it's working. One of the very large structural problems in, in conservation research is that these population estimates are made every five to 10 years, if you're lucky. Many species can go 15 or 20 years before having a comprehensive survey of how many there are. So that's a giant problem because if a local conservation strategy is put into effect, let's say put up a fence to protect the animal or take down a fence, ban fishing at a particular reef or allow fishing, how do we see if these are actually working? If we don't have iteration, 
to constantly reevaluate the population size and see whether a new change, like a conservation strategy, is helping or hurting, we really can't iterate and figure out whether any of these conservation strategies are working. However, in the engineering world, iteration is, is our bread and butter. It's a common part of what we do. So part of Wild Me's job is to speed up these iterations. And really, we also are trying to fill that gap between promising technology coming out of academia and the commercial world, and then its field application by biologists studying cheetahs and other species. And really, these field biologists are suffering from a number of problems. Conservation research is poorly funded. The technical skills that we have as software engineers generally are not part of the curriculum in training biologists. As well, the world of science is very much a world of experiments. Engineering experience is very different. An experiment showing me that a, a computer vision technique, a new algorithm for matching individuals, that experiment suggests that something is useful. But at the end of the day, what do we get? Some Java or some Python code. That doesn't actually make it useful. That doesn't mean it can be cross-applied to other species. It takes an engineer to step in and say, okay, let me take that. Let me harden that code. I'm going to run it through testing to make sure it actually doesn't fail in the field. And then I'm going to deploy it. And as soon as we deploy it, we know that users are going to use it in unanticipated ways. And we need a feedback loop back to the engineers to say, all right, this worked, but it didn't work in this circumstance where I'm using it differently and it needs to be maintained and advanced. And the only way we can help field biologists iterate is if we're there to help as much as possible to iterate both the software and bring in new technology. And ultimately what we're trying to do is scale and modernize and support frontline conservation efforts with software engineering skills. And really we're doing that at Wild Me in three different ways. One is to monitor animals continuously. It used to be in the world of marker capture and tagging animals, the biologists would often go into the field for a few weeks every year and then leave and would take those few weeks of data every year, let's say for five years, and create a population model suggesting whether the animal population was increasing or decreasing. We need to get to the point that if cameras are ubiquitous, that we can tag and track animals every day or every week, and that we can take daily snapshots of data and feed them into population estimates. We need to iterate from years between population models down to months, weeks, or even days with ultimately the ability for a field biologist to log into our software and answer the question, how many animals do I have today? How many cheetahs are estimated today versus yesterday? We internationalize this for a global audience and we're cross applying different machine learning algorithms and techniques as they are developed to the benefit of different research communities who are using the basic wild book open source. Currently, the team is tracking 131,000 animals across the globe, almost 700,000 sightings, over 6 million photographs, and currently we're working with about 900 wildlife researchers for different species. Monitoring animals continuously is one mode of estimating population sizes. The other is, what if it's too hard to monitor animals daily? Can we get meaningful snapshots, but get lots and lots of data from those snapshots? So a different way that my team works is through what are called rallies. And here I'm talking specifically about the Great Gravies Rally, which is held for two days every two years in Kenya. And the idea is to get hundreds of volunteers to drive all over and take pictures of Gravy zebras and to collect tens of thousands of photographs. This is as, as close to a census as to a full count as we'll ever get. However, at the end of this, what are we left with? 40,000 photographs per year times four years, 200,000 photographs. Each of those photographs has multiple zebras in them, and some of the photographs have no zebras. So that is a very unscalable exercise for human reviewers. This too is a great place for machine learning to step in and automate finding all of the zebras in the photographs and counting them. Out the other side of this, snap these large volume snapshots, we can create population estimates for different land areas and suggest whether the population is increasing or decreasing and in what section of the country it's doing so. The third mode of operation that we're doing as engineers in conservation is aerial surveys. And I showed you previously how difficult 
uh, counting animals from aerial surveys can be. In fact, this picture here of elephants with these pink boxes is sort of an ideal. It's never actually this easy. So we're also building an open source tool whose job it is to ingest hundreds of thousands of photographs taken by cameras mounted on planes as they fly back and forth across the savannah, counting elephants and other species, to be able to take those hundreds of thousands of photographs to rapidly train a machine learning model. Maybe we're going to annotate 10 or 20% of the data, build the machine learning model, and then process 90% of the data with machine learning. And what we have to do is not only develop the tool, the user interface, and the algorithms, but also prove that statistically that method, that machine learning based method of counting animals is as accurate or more accurate than humans and that it can um, operate in a fraction of the time and cost. So here's some of the, the novel challenges in the domain of wildlife, which is we, we often talk about big data in machine learning. Wildlife research is small data. Some researchers across a career have only hundreds of photographs of their species because they're studying something very rare or hard to photograph because it's far out at sea. As we apply machine learning to different species, the first step in our process is detection. We need to take each photograph and we need to be able to find one or more animals, whether it's a humpback whale in the upper left and its fluke is breaking the surface, whether it's a right whale's head popping out of the water in the upper right, whether it's a spotted dolphin in the bottom left, which travel in pods together, or whether it's a humpback whale dorsals here on the right as photographed from the boat. So with humpback whales in the upper left and bottom right, not only do we have to tag multiple individuals in photographs, but there are multiple areas on the body that we can identify them from. Think about this, the CIA only tracks one species. In wildlife research, we're tracking hundreds, if not thousands. So the first step is applying machine learning to do detection. So, the, so find animals in photographs and draw bounding boxes around them. Once we have a bounding box, we need the next step in machine learning detection, which is species prediction. Let's make sure that we're not ma trying to match a zebra to a, a killer whale, which is on the bottom here. That's a nonsensical match. So we need to distinguish animals by their type. Additionally, it doesn't make sense to match a zebra's left side to its right side. They are different patterns of stripes. Animals in the wild are not generally symmetrical in any way. So we also need to predict the viewpoint. Is this the left side of the zebra or the right side? And make sure that we're only matching left views to, left, to, to other left views of other zebras and right views to rights, tops to tops, bottoms to bottoms. And it can get quite complex with animals like cheetahs that can flop around and lay in large groups on the ground. We also do another step, which is coarse background segmentation. So as we not only draw these bounding boxes, we find that if our goal is to individually identify the animal, that there are confusing pixels in the image, pixels of the water, pixels of the grass, pixels of the trees, and other things in the photograph that are not the animal. As much as possible, we want to remove those pixels to prevent them from confusing the downstream identification algorithms that are trying to figure out who this is. There's also orientation. Animals in the wild don't like to stand still and they don't like to pose for us. So whether it's a, a right whale in the, on the upper left here, facing down in a photograph, or a, a right whale, depending on the camera and the drone and how it was oriented going up, or a dolphin going you know, uh, up at a 45 degree angle or flat, these different poses and perspectives can confuse identification algorithms. So we also use machine learning to snap animals to a common orientation. This takes a lot of training data, but once the model is in place, once we can compare animals on a common viewpoint and pose, we can increase the accuracy of our identification algorithms. And those algorithms work in increasingly different ways. And this is really where we're seeing a lot of iteration and very rapid development in the machine learning space around computer vision. New techniques are popping up all the time, and it's my team's job to try to adapt them rapidly and get them in the hands of biologists. 
one way that we can do individual identification is with visual texture. Here you'll see on the bottom yellow highlighted areas that show corresponding visual texture between two different pictures of the same food, the same individual animal taken over time and different poses. But visual texture is only one way that we can match individuals. And it can be a very confusing way. We also have to deal with photo bonds and scenery matching. And this is really where on the right, you can see where background segmentation, background subtraction helps. If we can remove confusing pixels of the environment, then it's easier to match the individual and, and false matches like this can happen. There are other cases, like a photobomb, where we see the rear end of the zebra in two different photographs, which could be matched, but then confuse one rear end with the body of the other animal. This is a challenge that the machine learning and computer vision also has to deal with. But we can also use different techniques other than the visual texture. We can use trailing edge match. So this same set of flukes can be matched based on the jaggedness of the trailing edge. And that jaggedness looks a lot like sound wave. And in fact, some of the original machine learning for sound analysis can be used to extract that edge and compare it as if it's a sound wave. And now we enter into true deep learning, triplet loss networks and such. We're now beginning to train machine learning uh, identification algorithms for which we don't exactly know what it's matching. Them. It's using the whole image. And so, for example, we have a new algorithm called those invariant embeddings, high triplet loss network based. And we train it on matched photographs, hundreds of individuals, and it comes up with its own decisions, creates a black box model, and it predicts ID. And we're starting to realize that we don't know exactly whether it's using parts of the trailing edge or some of the visual texture or something that we're not even paying attention to to make its decisions. But these new deep learning based algorithms are far more accurate than some of the original computer vision that was based on extracting the future. And as many industries that are applying artificial intelligence are running into, AI is very much a doorway to a little bit of a weird new world. Let me give you some examples from our space. So for example, right now, when we run a computer vision algorithm in support of a wildlife biologist, we present candidates, you know, when we're asking which zebra is this from the photograph, we present a list of candidates to the marine biologist or the zebra biologist in this case, and they pick from that list and they approve the match. I think it is match number one, and we're going to assign this photograph to that individual in the population. What if we took those human decisions out of the world? What if we treated an animal population as a cloud of photographs? What if we found every animal in every photograph? And what if we applied computer vision to apply pairwise scores between every photograph of every animal in a giant graph, a giant cloud of relationships. What if we created virtual teams? What if there were no human decisions at all? And instead, machine learning was responsible for navigating this graph to find all the photographs of an individual, and then we fed that into population. If we pass the, the initial predictor, then we can extract keyframes out of the video, run computer vision detection that we talked about, find the frames of the whale shark in the video, and run them to individual ID. Similarly, we can apply natural language processing, NLP, to find the date, the when, and the where. Both of those can be detected with machine learning models. We can quite literally take a YouTube video from somebody's vacation posted randomly, get who, where, and when, and feed that into our sharkbook.ai platform as a legitimate data point in a population study. Now, there's some interesting facts about this experiment. This individual bot collected more data in a year than all of the human researchers combined. It had a lot more false data in it. The data was messy. Oftentimes there were nonsensical videos that made it in. So while a human might submit 75% of it data, its data that results in an individual ID, the bot only had a 30% individual ID rate. However, it collected a lot more data and 90% of the individual IDs that came about from the bot were not collected by the human world. 
What this means is that this intelligent agent was actually, actually collecting original data and participating in a human research community. So back to business, and we need to start wrapping this back up in engineering. We as engineers meaningfully participate in the world of conservation research, and we find this role between academia and field conservation. And it really comes back to our design principles. We have to scale our problems and do it cost effectively. We have to define customer profiles, consider our user bases, make sure, especially in the world of conservation, that we're doing no harm. We have to make sure that we're presenting data accurately and not in any way that's prone to misinterpretation because it can literally kill animals or cause bad decisions to be made. And we have to make sure that everything we develop solves problems. We have to check our assumptions and make sure we understand the use cases. All of these are standard software development practices in designing systems. We also, just like any uh, software engineering project in the corporate world, have alpha, beta, and production servers. We have distinct QA roles. I often play that role on my team so that we can make sure that somebody's checking the software before it gets into the hand of field biologists. And of course, function means nothing without good user design. We need to make sure that these advanced, very sophisticated computer vision algorithms are easily explained and have good, a good user experience. We also, unlike a lot of open source projects, need to provide support. That means that we don't just throw things into open source and expect somehow that field biologists will A, find it, and B, use it successfully without error. We are there at community.wildme.org every day answering questions from field biologists across the globe, finding bugs, fixing those bugs, and supporting them in their conservation research journey. This is a really important part about open source. Somebody needs to be there to help. I wanna thank the network of supporters behind us, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Microsoft, the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, and H2O AI, all have put significant support behind our engineering team, and all of whom really recognize and understand the need for concrete long-term engineering in conservation research. And I want to thank you very much for attending my talk and, and challenge you to think about these software engineering skills that you have. How can they be applied, even if it's not in um, you know, uh, a very specific domain? If you're not interested in animals, what about plants? What about uh, CO2 carbon capture? What about using machine learning to predict deforestation? There are even machine learning projects out there looking to translate whales in something called Project SETI. There is a diverse array of really interesting and somewhat mind-bending projects that you can participate in and be a fully respected team member, not just in a volunteering, I'm gonna commit some code and walk away, but actually as part of the process of discovery, of learning something about our natural world using the skills you have um, developed in the corporate world. So I wanna challenge you to think about how can you take your software engineering skills and apply them in a way that can help conservation research in general, whatever aspect of it you, it, whatever aspect of it is of interest to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for such an interesting talk. You have so meaningful job. It's very cool. Thank you. Thank you very much.